One early winter's morning in 1965, a band traveling home from a gig in Woodstock, New York, had their journey suddenly interrupted by car trouble. Well, this is a tale many of us regular folks can relate to. The circumstances surrounding this incident are noteworthy. The van was carrying one of the most influential musicians of the 20th century, visionary guitarist Jimi Hendrix. With Jimmy were several other members of the band, including Curtis Knight. Now, years later, Curtis would share the details of when disaster struck. It was four o'clock in the morning, and we were trying to make it back to Manhattan, a drive of more than 100 miles through the worst blizzard I can recall, he would later explain. Now, these driving conditions were treacherous enough, and that was when things would take a turn for the worse. The car was swept into a snowdrift and then stopped Jimmy, Curtis, and other musicians watched as the driver kept trying to leave, but the wheels only spun in the snow. They were stuck. They sat there helpless as the minutes ticked on by, the temperature dropping steadily, despite the fact that the heater was running full blast. And as the heater ran, everyone in the band began to feel drowsy. Only years later, with the benefit of hindsight, would they realize that the van might have been filling with carbon monoxide. It was a very dangerous situation. At any moment, anyone might pass out and be claimed by the gas or the cold, both of which kept steadily creeping in. But that was when something miraculous happened. According to Curtis, the snow on the road slowly began to glow, glow brighter, and it became apparent that something was descending out of the whirlwind of the blizzard, a tall, pointed structure shaped almost like a cone. The object finally came to rest on the road, no more than a hundred feet away. Whatever stupor the cold and the carbon monoxide had placed them in vanished as the entire band, including Jimi Hendrix, noticed this strange sight. Now, the panic was short-lived as what happened next unfolded in mere moments. From somewhere on the side of the craft, a panel slid open, a tall figure effortlessly glided from the landed shape, heading in the direction of the van, melting the snow on the ground as it floated. Now, only seconds later, it was standing on the right-hand side of the vehicle, gazing through the window directly at Jimi Hendrix. The musician and the monster stared at each other. Curtis Knight said that Jimmy seemed to be communicating telepathically with it, whatever it was. Now, as the two held each other's gaze, the other band members noticed something astonishing. The interior of the vehicle rapidly began to warm, allowing them to turn down the heater. Now, at the same time, the snowdrift that the van had become mired in melted away, freeing the tires and allowing them to gain traction on the newly cleared road. Then, just as quickly as the being appeared, it retreats back toward the tall cone in the snow and disappears within. The side hatch slid shut, and the object began a forceful, steady ascent into the sky, just like a rocket on a launch pad, slipping free of all gravity. Everyone in the band was stunned, or as I can imagine in the 60s with everyone doped up on drugs, whoa, dude, that's pretty killer, man. <laughs> Maybe not, though. They were probably sober. No one said a word as they continued their journey home, and only years later did Curtis Knight remember the incident. He claimed that the entire band acted as though they had been hypnotized. Jimmy had an interesting reaction, though, when Curtis brought the event up later in conversation. And Curtis said, Jimmy never did talk about what happened. He sort of let me know that the cool thing was not to bring up the subject. It was to be our little secret. In private, Jimi Hendrix appears to have been a bit more forthcoming about his experiences. He claimed numerous encounters with UFOs and eventually shared what he had come to believe with his girlfriend, Monica Donovan, who was a figure skater and painter from Germany and would be the only person with Jimmy in the hours preceding his death in 1970. She said this, Jimmy was convinced 
that in the near future, galacticians from outer space, from another galaxy of great positive power, would come to our planet to help mankind in its struggle with evil. While explaining this, he drew two points representing this higher power coming closer and closer towards our galaxy, the Milky Way, finally reaching Earth. He told me that the arrival of the extraterrestrials would bring about a great change on our planet, and that love, peace, and brotherhood among the peoples of the Earth would start to blossom again, just as they did in the ancient civilization of Atlantis. Now, one question from Curtis Knight's story still lingers. What did this being look like? Now, according to Curtis Knight, Jimi Hendrix got the best look of anyone in the band. He said that Jimmy compared it to kind of like a cross between a feathered creature, maybe like Mothman and an angel. Anyone interested in the paranormal should have their ears perk up at the mention of Mothman. Could this infamous being sometimes connected to extraterrestrials, sometimes connected to cryptids, have actually appeared to have one of rock and roll's iconic figures? Well, if so, we have to ask whether it was Jimi Hendrix who made that comparison or Curtis Knight, who drew that distinction years after the sighting. You see, the name Mothman wouldn't be used to describe a large winged humanoid until nearly a year later at the very least. So the term Mothman first emerged during the creature sighting in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which I'm sure many of you are already well familiar with, which unfolded between 1966 and 1967. Now, following a sighting from two couples on November 15th, 1966, the entire town, even the entire region of West Virginia was swept into a mania featuring not only the Mothman itself, but a whole host of accompanying high strangeness, including, but not limited, to odd lights in the sky, UFO sightings, strange visitors comparable to the men in black, and poltergeist phenomena. Now, the aspect of these sightings that received the most coverage in the press, however, was the Mothman himself, named after the second-rate Batman villain killer, Moth. The entity was famous for, well, really two things its large, intense, red glowing eyes, and its massive wingspan, which allowed it to pace cars traveling as fast as 62 miles per hour. Dang. Now, some sightings described it having a head, while others suggested that its head was held low or that it lacked a head entirely, its eyes set into its wide shoulders. Now, events in Point Pleasant culminated on December 15th, 1967, when 46 people were killed after the Silver Bridge connecting Ohio to West Virginia collapsed into the icy waters of the Ohio River. A fracture only three millimeters deep caused the entire structure to come crumbling down, making it the deadliest bridge accident in the United States history. While there is no direct evidence that Mothman was to blame, the timing of the incident, coupled with numerous warnings about an impending disaster chronicled by researcher John Keel in his 1975 book, The Mothman Prophecies, would cement Mothman's reputation as a sort of harbinger of doom, predicting mass death in the aftermath of its appearance. Now, it is true that, at least sometimes, tragedy befalls Mothman witnesses. As with the infamous Silver Bridge incident, However, it is often difficult, if not impossible, to prove that the creature has anything to do with these disasters. In fact, one example where Mothman brought bad luck to those who saw it comes to us from the writer and researcher Nick Redfern. According to Nick, an elderly couple approached him in 2001 to share a very unsettling encounter that would unfold in early 1946 in Littlefield, Texas. Now, the couple told Nick that the incident took place at a property that sat on the edge of town. There stood a large old house owned by two elderly sisters who had a reputation for being reclusive and eccentric. Over the years, the sisters' house earned a frightening reputation among kids in the neighborhood. They would often tease and dare each other into prowling about the property, often in the dead of night. Well, Late one evening, a group of young thrill seekers decided to patrol the building themselves. We can all see where this is going. Tensions ran high as they crept around the house, shh, 
unsure of what lay just beyond the next corner, and as they rounded the bend outside, they saw something more horrific than they expected. A pair of massive creatures emerging from the cellar door. What are we in an X-Files episode here, guys? Both of them acted stealthily as they wished their presence to go unnoticed. When they stood, the children said that the beings were immense, each towering over the witnesses around eight feet tall beyond what this camera lens could even show and sported a pair of enormous leathery wings. Not feathery, leathery. These, like their bodies, were covered in gray, disgusting skin, which provided a sharp contrast to their eyes, which glowed blood red. Now, once the creatures came out of the cellar and stretched, they spun around in the direction of the kids. Everyone froze in terror, some screaming, as the beings then took off across the property, half hopping, half running. After gaining enough momentum, both monsters unfurled their wings and took off into the night sky. Now, several of the witnesses added a very odd detail. Well, according to Nick Redfern, they said that the limbs of the creatures looked almost hollow against the background of the full moon that loomed overhead. After the creature's departure, the kids decided it was time to leave the property ASAP. And as they fled, two of them looked back to the house. They claimed that from one of the upper windows, both sisters were glaring down into the yard grinning maniacally. The fact that they weren't surprised, to the contrary, they seemed pleased. It suggested that they somehow had a connection to the two abominations that had emerged from the cellar. Perhaps they were witches that had summoned these demons to do their bidding. It's hard to say. The aftermath of this sighting would unfold over the next several months when a motorist in the area eventually saw something resembling the kid's description of the creatures standing in the middle of the road and sadly moaning. However, that isn't the most unsettling thing to happen in Littlefield, Texas after the 1946 Mothman sighting. Now again, according to Nick Redfern, the old couple who shared this story with him claimed that all the witnesses to a person had died at surprisingly young ages from a variety of seemingly unlikely accidents. While the Littlefield sightings took place two decades before the collapse of the Silver Bridge, well, it seems to hint at what can only be described as the Mothman Curse, an idea that did not take root until the publication of John Keel's research in 1975. Now, both cryptozoologist and ufologist debate how strong this curse is if it exists at all. Now, many point to the fact that countless documented Mothman sightings are only ever followed by a little bad luck and nothing more. Still, more witnesses report nothing out of the ordinary at all afterward, Certainly nothing as tragic as death and destruction. Now, much of the lore surrounding the Mothman curse is a product of Keel's writing, which doubled down on the idea to a varying degree of believability. Now, as evidence, he cited the deaths of several major players in the Point Pleasant sightings, as well as the deaths of prominent ufologists all within 10 years of the Silver Bridge collapse. Also, it's kind of worth noting using the same criteria, we could easily lump Jimi Hendrix's death into the list of Mothman victims. He was dead within five years of his sighting at the tragically young age of 27, but his death is a whole other video worth of content, so I'll save that for later. Now, more convincingly, through a series of mysterious phone calls and channeled communications, John Keel claimed to have learned about John F. Kennedy's assassination during his time in Point Pleasant, but was unable to reach the president in time. Now, he also claimed to have learned that Martin Luther King Jr. would be assassinated assassinated in Memphis on February 4th, 1968, and even tried desperately to reach the civil rights leader on the phone. Keel failed in the effort, but was relieved to be proven wrong when February 4 came and went without any incident. Then, two months later to the day, King was taken out on April 4th, 1968. Now, more recently, the Mothman curse seems to manifest in more unpredictable ways. 
in January of 2004, the husband of Kimberly Frazier's stepdaughter passed away following a horrific car accident near Olive Hill, Kentucky. Just six months earlier, Kimberly claimed to have seen a large winged shape soaring through the summer sky in the exact same location that her stepdaughter's husband died. Several manifestations of the Mothman curse have made headlines in the past few decades. Well, none were Mothman witnesses themselves, they were still associated with the entity as filmmakers. A November 2006 article for the MUFON Journal, noted cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman wrote this. Lisa McIntosh, who is the associate producer of the documentary Mothman, Man, Myth, or Monster, died on July 5th, 2006 of a rare cancer called multiple myeloma. Now, the executive producer, Barry Conrad, explains that, strangely enough, she began having fainting spells while in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, during our visit in September 2004. Now, she was only 42 years of age. Doctors said it was a textbook case, extremely unusual that this type of cancer would affect someone as young as she was. Now, only one out of approximately 200,000 people contract this disease. The mystery death of people associated with Mothman films and investigations is a topic that I have documented for some time. July has not been a kind month for those who have experienced these strangely Mothman-related deaths. On June 30th, 2004, a Jennifer Barrett Pellington, 42, wife of the Mothman Prophecies director Mark Pellington, died after a never-identified brief illness in Los Angeles. Now, she was involved in costume design and even received a thank you credit on the Mothman Prophecies. On July 16th, 2005, Mark Chorvinsky, 51, editor of Strange Magazine of Rockville, Maryland, died after his relatively quiet battle with cancer. Three investigations of Chorvinsky's overlapped with Mothman prophecies, including his interviews with people who cited what Chorvinsky called the Potomac Mothman. Another catastrophe often associated with Mothman is the April 26th, 1986 Chernobyl nuclear incident. Both in terms of lives lost and cost, it remains the world's worst nuclear power plant disaster. Only after spending the equivalent of more than, I think it was like $68 billion, was the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics able to get the situation under control. One of the atomic reactors at the Chernobyl atomic power plant near the city of Kiev was damaged. Similar puzzling reports of high radiation came in from all over Scandinavia. A radioactive cloud headed north across Poland today and into Denmark, where radiation levels were five times normal. For many, it was too late. Both first responders and people in the vicinity of the power plant would suffer from radiation-induced cancers for years and years to come. Even for those who did not suffer physically, the impact was significant. Tens of thousands of residents were forced to evacuate and abandon their homes. In the decades since the meltdown, stories have emerged claiming that just days prior to its failure, the plant was visited by an enormous black bird with a 20-foot wingspan. Reports supposedly came from technicians in the control room and other personnel surveying the grounds outside on foot. Now, one of these stories described something large and black swooping through the skies above Chernobyl. It seemed to have the torso of a man, but completely lacked a head. Its red eyes appeared to be placed near the shoulders, as in some Point Pleasant accounts. Now, those who witnessed this visitor reported it to their coworkers, who confirmed that they too had seen or heard about this creature, which carried it with the nickname, the Blackbird of Chernobyl. Now, from that point forward, workers at the plant reported being harassed by mysterious phone calls and suffering from terrifying nightmares. Rumors suggest that the sightings of the Black Bird of Chernobyl would continue until literal moments before the disaster. Reports of Mothman putting in an appearance just prior to the Chernobyl meltdown are tantalizing, but most researchers agree that these stories have also been exaggerated. It's a little bit too much to get into here, but they mostly believe that the Chernobyl Mothman stories arose by accident, following a confusingly written afterword added to the 1991 reissue of John Keel's The Mothman Prophecies. 
Now, both Lauren Coleman and Nick Redfern assert that none of the Chernobyl Mothman tales can be traced back to their primary sources with really any degree of reliability or credibility for that matter. The Chernobyl stories may or may not be authentic. Better evidence exists connecting Mothman to another nuclear disaster, one that happened just over a decade ago. If true, some of the creature's sightings in 2011 can be directly linked to one of the most profound catastrophes in recent memory. In March of that year, Japan was hit with a magnitude 9 earthquake. In addition to sending the ground rolling beneath their feet, residents of the Tohoku region had to contend with a tsunami battering the coastline. Because the earthquake, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was significantly damaged. And over the coming days, the world watched in horror as the plant entered a nuclear meltdown whose effects are still felt a dozen years later. The surrounding environment, community, and flora and fauna were all poisoned to varying degrees. What lurks contributor and author of The Unexplained, Brent Swanser, ladies and gentlemen, lives in Japan and was among the first to collect reports of something that, in hindsight, might have predicted the Fukushima disaster. When hearing these accounts, a startling possibility emerges that Mothman may have visited Japan just prior to the earthquake. Now, among the witnesses that Brent cites is an American businessman, Marcus Pules, who claimed to have been on a work trip to Japan in February of 2011. Marcus was staying with an old friend in Okuma, just three miles away from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. One evening, Marcus and his host were walking the shore near the station when they heard something strange. It was a rushing or whooshing sound. Now, at first, both of them thought it was just the waves crashing against the boulders that scattered the coast. Their assessment changed when the sound repeated itself and was accompanied by a horrendous shriek <coughs> unlike anything they had ever heard. Marcus described the noises as shaking him down to the bone and making the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. A couple walking nearby out for a romantic walk along the coast also reacted to the shriek, ensuring him that it wasn't just a figment of his imagination. Of course, the couple pointed towards the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant looming in the distance and there roosted on top of one of the buildings and silhouetted against the moonlight and the floodlights was a large figure and it was dark and as they watched it stretched a pair of enormous appendages long broad and wing-like on either side it flapped these several times before taking flight where it circled above the nuclear power plant several times now according to brent marcus's descriptions of the flight patterns went as follows the creature then took flight and circled the plant at least four to five times some circuits he took at a fast pace some he seemed to slow down all the while he kept his attention on the row of square shaped buildings that i later found out housed the reactors the creature then came toward us flying at least 25 to 30 feet off the ground. The younger couple who had noticed the creature first were now screaming and cowering, the man shielding the woman while shielding his head with a jacket. My friend and I looked in awe as this creature flew over us. That's when I noticed the two large red eyes. They seemed to glow from within and with a blood red hue. They were unblinking in the three to four seconds we saw them. We knew they were looking straight at us. We knew this creature knew we could see it and it made no attempt to disguise itself. The sick, intense, and overwhelming feeling of dread came over us. A feeling that we shouldn't be there was to say the least, overwhelming. Marcus's friend tried to pull out his phone and snap a picture of the beast, but it was too late. The winged creature was simply too far in the distance, heading toward town. Because of the time of day, all the pictures turned out too dark. Now, both Marcus and his friend dashed home discussing what they had seen, a conversation they would continue well into that night. Had it just been a trick of the light? Could it have been a gigantic bird? All these explanations felt hollow. They knew what they had seen and it was unnatural. Now, the following month, Marcus was back home in the United States when he flicked on the television and saw news that the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, the very place where he and his friend had just seen the creature, had been damaged. 
A sickening feeling arose in his gut. Could the creature have caused this disaster or at least been trying to warn people of an imminent catastrophe. Marcus would say this, the Fukushima Daiichi was the exact same plant we had seen the strange bird-like creature circling. Was it pure coincidence, or was it the mythical Mothman doing his strange work of predicting disasters? I may never know, and may go to the grave wondering that, but one thing is certain for sure, I don't think that neither of us is going to forget this event, no matter how long we live. As compelling as Marcus story is, it gains additional credibility from another testimony offered by an unrelated witness. Brent Swanser also told the tale of a man he called Hiroshi, who preferred to remain anonymous. On March 10th, 2011, just a day before the earthquake hit, Hiroshi was in the Fukushima area on a business trip, and like Marcus, he and a friend had decided to take an evening stroll in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant when they noticed something out of the ordinary. Now, their first reaction was that a bird was flying overhead. Even this didn't seem quite right. The creature seemed to have a wingspan somewhere between 10 and 15 feet across. Hiroshi and his friend watched whatever it was soar over a bluff and just above some nearby treetops. An uneasy sense that was no bird crept into Hiroshi's mind. No birds in Japan were that big. Both he and his companion watched it continue its trajectory in the direction of the Fukushima plant, its movements completely silent. Now, Brett spoke to Hiroshi, who told him the following. Whatever this thing was, suddenly rose up really high into the air and circled a few times before coming down to one of the buildings at the nuclear facility and landing right on top of it. We could then see that it was not a bird. It was standing there and it was very humanoid in shape. Its wings now folded up over its back. It was dusk and some distance away, so we could not see it in very great detail. But it was definitely humanoid, with two arms and and two noticeable legs. We could see no facial features, but the head seemed oversized. The creature stood very still there on that roof and seemed to be looking out over the ocean, its head moving as if it was scanning the horizon. It remained there for a few minutes and then leapt off the edge of the building and shot up into the sky, where it once again circled and then flew off out of sight. And the next morning, Hiroshi headed home to Tokyo, where he learned about the Fukushima meltdown. Now, you tell me, guys, what are the odds that two witnesses completely independent would have such similar stories to share? I mean, sure, it's possible, but why does Mothman seem to appear just before a tragedy? Is it evil or is it good? Is this simply a cause of misfortune or simply trying to warn us? Now, one thing is for certain. If you should see something human-shaped flying through the sky, be on high alert. It doesn't just pose a danger to you in the present, it may well threaten your future. And since you guys made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, I done seen a moth man. So that way I know who's made it this far into the video. And if you guys enjoy content just like this, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more videos by yours truly. And as always guys, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next video.